What is something that happened in history, that if it happened in a movie, people would call plot hole? I'm sure the leaders of England, Germany and Russia just happened to be cousins in this great war. They just made that up so they could use the same actor to play both, King George V and Tsar Nicholas II. Titanic would be considered lazy writing, the worst maritime accident at the time and it happened with what was billed as the first unsinkable ship dart on its maiden voyage. Matthias Gallus, the destroyer of armies, in 1637 he ordered his army to march into a wasteland with no food, and most of his soldiers starved to death. In 1638, he took command of another army and marched into the same wasteland, and they starved to death again. The movie writers obviously didn't proofread their script. Are we supposed to believe that anyone would be stupid enough to walk into the same disaster twice? Leonard Funk. In January 1945 Funk's company was deployed to Belgium to help prevent a German breakout during the Battle of the Bulge. After a 15 mile march in heavy snow, the company lost its executive officer, and Funk took command. Failing to gather enough infantrymen to take out a German strongpoint, he recruited men from the company office. Funk led this makeshift platoon of 30 clerks through waist deep snow, under artillery shelling and harassing fire, overran the strong point and captured 30 Germans. Another unit had captured 50 enemy troops, and US forces corralled the two groups of prisoners in the yard of a house, leaving four men to guard them. Funk returned to the fight. Later that day, after running into heavy resistance, R. Funk and another soldier returned to warn the four-man guard and check on the prisoners. In the interim a patrol of Germans, wearing white camouflage capes similar to those worn by American troops, had surprised the guards and freed the prisoners. Also mistaking the Germans for US troops, Funk walked straight into the yard, where an enemy officer shoved a machine pistol into his gut, perhaps as a ruse. Perhaps from stress or perhaps simply because he was struck by the absurdity of the situation. Funk Asaho spoke no German a subrogan to laugh. The more he laughed, so the story goes. The angrier the German officer got, the angrier he got. The more he shouted, the less Funk understood and the more the young American laughed. Finally seeming to regain his composure, Funk moved to unsling his Thompson submachine gun as if to surrender it. But instead of giving up the weapon, he emptied a full magazine into the red-faced officer. The other Germans quickly returned fire, while Funk yelled at the other GIs to pick up dropped German weapons and join the fight. In less than a minute his ragtag force killed 21 of the enemy, wounded 24 more and recaptured the remainder. That was the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Funk reportedly cracked in the aftermath of the Fi fight. It's annoying how the whole blimp thing just got dropped by the writers. 1919. Everyone is into blimps. Blimps can fly super high, much higher than planes. AA guns can't shoot them down. Planes can't shoot them down. They can even drop planes off of them like an aircraft carrier. Nations establish strategic helium supplies for the Great War of the Blimps and 1939 comes around. Nothing. Zip. Nada. What the heck? Did they fire the showrunner or something? Not strictly a plot hole, but I'd probably choose the two Mongol invasions of Japan that were stopped both times by typhoons. Can't think of a more deus ex machina moment than that. And to top it off, it happened twice. Taijo Brahe's life. It's like a child wrote it. He lost part of his nose in a duel about a mathematical formula, and wore a brass nose around for the rest of his life. He hired a dwarf named Jep to be his assistant pet because he thought Jep was a psychic. Jep lived under the dining room table. He had a pet moose that got too drunk at one of his 16th century rages and died from falling downstairs. Taicho died of a ruptured bladder from holding his pee for too long. Rumor is he didn't want to be rude and get up from the table during a dinner with the king of Hungary to pee. And after all that Johannes Kepler got credit for his work in astrophysics. Edit. 16th century. Napoleon's escape from Elba. The Dunkirk evacuation would be an eye-rolling example of and of course the good guy's friends come galloping in at the last minute to save the seemingly doomed heroes. The Cambrian explosion. We have a perfect fossil record of nothing but algae. Then one day the fossil record includes fully evolved animal life. 
I don't know who wrote the script to the Jim Lee Glider, but the whole deal was just contrived as hell. Kinda like if they'd made a Speed 3, or if the Asylum ripped off Sully. Spoilers incoming. First, a fuel gauge goes out on an Air Canada jet, which is kinda implausible since this particular plane was a new state-of-the-art 767 that had only been in service for two years at that point. But what ifs? Because the fuel gauge is busted, the ground crews have to fuel the plane manually. Part of this is that they have to convert the fuel quantity from volume to weight in order to load the necessary amount onto the plane. But wait. Canada had just converted to the metric system at this time. Yet the crew mistakenly used the conversion factor for pounds instead of kilograms. Meaning that there was only half as much fuel as needed for the long haul flight. What? The pilot double checks the ground crew's calculation. Except he uses the incorrect conversion factor as well. The plane takes off anyway. Uh oh. During a stopover in Ottawa, the pilot checks the fuel levels again and uses the incorrect conversion factor again. Meaning the plane still doesn't have enough fuel for the long flight to Edmonton. Okay what the duck. Somewhere over Ontario at 41,000 feet. The plane predictably runs out of fuel entirely. This is not good. Folks, I don't see how they could possibly serve. Wait, what? The pilot. The same pilot who mistakenly measured the fuel twice. Just so happens to also be a very experienced glider pilot who thinks he can land this duck in thing with just math and glide ratios. And it? What kind of cheap ass Marty Stu redemption arc horse it is this? Sigh. Okay. Where they gonna land this thing? Doesn't look like they can make it to Winnipeg. So they might have to ditch in the middle of a fi. UHH. I mean this. Decommissioned Air Force Base right here, that the co-pilot just happens to know all about since he was stationed there when he was in the service. Right. So they're coming in to land at RCAF Deus Ex Machina. Cool. But, what's this? There's a, what? A drag race happening on the runway where they need to land? Are we in sweeps week or something? Take about last minute. Unnecessary drama. Not as last minute as the two boys riding bicycles on part of the runway who narrowly missed a 767 coming in for a silent landing right on top of them. Though. Hugh. But in the end. Everyone's fine. Crew is fine. Passengers are all fine. The race car drivers are fine. The kids on bikes are fine. The metric system sort of took a hit but oh well. And trusty RC Gorn was even repaired and put back into service. Hooray. That one time when an army went to battle with 80 troops and came back with 81. Script supervisor missed that one. I'm at work and refuse to look up details and facts. German intelligence and counterintelligence during World War II. Nobody could be that stupid constantly. Chemist Fritz Haber's dubious contribution to 20th century history. Imperial Germany in World War I was heavily blockaded and needed a way of synthesizing ammonia. Haber, a patriotic German, solved that problem, which enabled Germany to continue manufacturing high explosives, the kind they stuffed into artillery shells at Verdun. N. Haber heads the scientific team that developed chlorine gas, a uniquely awful way of killing people, as if shrapnel wasn't bad enough. So already, our clever pal Fritz is indirectly responsible for millions of deaths. Here's where it gets good. A few years after the armistice, Haber gets into agriculture by developing pesticides. His most famous creation, an agent called Zyklon A. Sound familiar? It's the predecessor to the chemical used to gas Jews in the death camps. Historical note, not all the camps. Treblinka, for example, used carbon monoxide courtesy of a Soviet tank engine. Fritz Haber was a Jew. I don't know whether this character was written as a mad scientist or what. Maybe he's supposed to be a cautionary tale. Something about good intentions. Either way, it's lazy writing and highly improbable stuff and I'm awfully sore about it. Edit. Disclaimer. No one should take my comment as historical fact. I encourage you to read the various comments and sources below. Fritz Haber was a complicated man and his life is worth examining further. Seems that a lot of people don't know what a plot hole is. Literally everything Hannibal put his mind to. Everyone goes into battle on horseback. Then there's a dumb montage. And all of a sudden tanks. Not a plot hole but the French showing up to help the Americans is Deus Ex Machina and a cheap writing decision. 
A lone Soviet tank holding an entire German division for one day in the Battle of Rasenai in 1941. From between giants, the battle for the Baltics in World War II. More than a KV-1 or KV-2 tank. Accounts vary. Advanced far behind the German lines after attacking a column of German trucks. The tank stopped on a road across soft ground and was engaged by four 50mm anti-tank guns of the 6th Panzer Division Anti-Tank Battalion. The tank was hit several times but fired back, disabling all four guns. A heavy 88mm gun of the Divisional Anti-Aircraft Battalion was moved about 730 meters, 800 did, behind the tank but was knocked out by the tank before a good score are hit. During the night, German combat engineers tried to destroy the tank with satchel charges but failed despite possibly damaging the tracks. Early on the morning of the 25th of June, German tanks fired on the KV from the woodland while an 88mm gun fired at the tank from its rear. Of several shots fired, only two penetrated the tank. German infantry advanced and the KV opening machine gun fire against them and the tank was knocked out by grenades thrown into the hatches. According to some accounts, the crew was buried by the German soldiers with full military honors. In other accounts, the crew escaped during the night. Not a plot hole, but after surviving so many ways of killing him, we would be saying that Rasputin had some pretty thick plot armor. Leif Erikson and his exploration and settlement of North America, if European history from the fall of Rome to the Renaissance, was a series of movies, when it's time for Columbus and the rest of the conquistadors people would be saying, are they going to pretend that the scenes in Vinland at the end of part II never happened, and an entire civilization just sort of forgot about North America, it'd be like the Knights of Wren, only worse. The Korean War. How can the most powerful army on the planet get close to winning a war, then get pushed back by another powerful nation and just leave the war running in the background in some unstable ceasefire for 60 years? Clearly the writers didn't realize the need to flesh out an ending to this plot point. Back in the 1980s and early 90s everyone just decided that kids were being molested and abused as part of satanic rituals. They arrested dozens of people and put them on trial for doing things that aren't actually possible according to the laws of physics. Basically, we randomly had another Salem witch trials. We have organ transplants, computers, and we've been to the moon. But still believe these ridiculous claims. Elephants and giraffes were sacrificed, because those are so easy to come by. Babies were flushed down the toilet, abused, cleaned up, and sent back to their parents. Oh and the abusers can fly, and the pubic and virtually all the jurors were all up, seems legit. I'm pretty sure it was during the French Revolution that a cavalry regiment won a naval battle because the ships had frozen into the harbor. Alexander the Great's conquests. The man conquered so much of the world before he died and only stopped because his men were tired of him being so awesome at it that they wanted to go home. Then he died at age 32 because if he hadn't he'd have been king of the whole bloody planet before he was 45. It's like they took every good quality of mythological heroes and put it into one being so perfect that fate itself had to spit into his eye to stop him from being so. Here in Brazil, Senator Arnon de Mello shot and killed another senator in the Senate chamber. Guess what happened to him? Nothing. He resumed his political career, and his son. Fernando Cala de Mello was even elected president. The British and French empires just coincidentally fall when America starts being the protagonist of the story in the plot against the USSR. Su Wuyuri. Okay. Writers. Edit. I did a four page essay on this last semester. It was no coincidence. The colonies were just too expensive to run after both world wars. The UN put too much pressure on the nations to ditch their colonies. And both of the world powers at the time were trying to make them into pawns for their global chess game. Nelson Mandela becoming president after he died. The Bronze Age collapse. There is no one that truly knows what happened. At least three major civilizations collapsed. One of them being the most ancient throughout all of history. Being Egypt. They all had writing which they regularly used. But the only evidence from writing is of a mysterious people called the Sea People. There are multiple theories involving sickness, rebellions and disasters. These empires should not have collapsed. At least not without major writing. Edit. Watch. 
this series, buy extra credits for more, it's amazing. US nuclear weapon development during World War II. It is almost impossible to believe that the US was able to hide development of a bomb that could destroy entire cities when thousands of people worked on the project and a nuke was detonated during testing. Edit. Only one nuke was detonated during testing before it was used against Japan. There's the story of the stolen panel from a van I called a piece in Ghent, Belgium. It was mysteriously robbed in 1934 from the church and never been found. There was an exchange of ransom notes with the police, but it came to a halt unexpectedly. A few months after the heist a stockbroker who suffered from a heart attack confessed on his deathbed that he alone knows the location of the missing painting, and he directed his lawyer to a desk drawer where carbon copies of all the ransom notes have been found, including an unsent letter that contained a clue about the location, and still, no one could figure it out. Only last week. An amateur puzzler announced in a press conference promoting a book he co-written that he figured out the location from that last note and that it's buried under a cobblestone square in Ghent. IT involved cracking the codes, drawing routes on a map, true Da Vinci code stuff. The authorities are taking it super seriously and are looking into the best way to dig up the square. I truly hope it's there. It would be insane. I mean, the deathbed confession part seems a little excessive. No? The Great Emu War. The Emus won. They never really resolved the whole second coming story arc. Still holding out for a reboot but losing hope. Okay. I'm not a simpleton. I know in writing that with every new movie or reboot, there has to be rising stakes. But eventually it gets ridiculous. But when you have this glorious struggle for humans to build the first airplane, the first power device to stay in the air, and only do it for 12 seconds. This beautiful struggle of humanity and science. But all you have are a couple of sequels. A fancy reboot. And 66 years later they're putting humans on the moon? They had barely just begun to understand the moon in the 19th century. And they know enough to fly there? We're talking about a human civilization that took over 2000 years to go from bronze to iron. And they go from an unstable 12 second flight to space travel in 66. Inconceivable. Thank god they stopped making sequels. The moon was ridiculous enough. But Mars? Another star? Please. No one would believe that. The United States landed and walked on the moon. But since then no one has been back. Clearly the problem is budget from the studios and the writers are forced to tell us to forget about it and focus on Mars. White Death. Seriously. What sniper could take out so many bad guys? And the bad guys giving him what is essentially his own superhero name? Ridiculous. Also, Audie Murphy. His exploits in World War II were so insane that moviegoers refuse to believe even the toned down version they put in his movie. So you're telling me this guy just went nuts and fortified a bulldozer into an impenetrable tank he called the Killdozer? Get the duck out of here. The Americans joining World War 1. Everyone watching the movie knows that America is op. The Germans had a chance of winning. But now it looks like the writers just wanted the allies to win the either way. Using the Germans as the bad guys for World War 2 is way too cliche. And of course the main villain has a weird mustache. At least he didn't have a big scar over his eye. It happens on the 15th of April. And musicians die at 27. Basically every genocide ever. So you're telling me that a maniac is killing millions of people and the rest of the world doesn't band together immediately to stop it. Just want to give you props. OP. For one of the most original ascredic questions I've seen. I was in a class where we watched old western films. People complained about the cheesy ricochet sound of the bullet twang. No one realized that sound is real. The Battle of Britain. Germans lose despite having superior numbers. Better aircraft. Better training and better tactics. In a film you'd think it was just nonsense. Like Bruce Willis taking on professional mercenaries and winning. Using only gum and a pen. Trump being elected is a huge one to me. Not trying to go political. But consider this. 1. Hugely popular in Texas. In the 80s I clearly remember a commercial for barbecue sauce that involved cowboys figuring out their chef was using sauce from NY. It ended with Osage at a rope. 
Texans typically aren't into major players from a city, especially NY. 2. He's elitist as hell. My friends from the south used to be outraged when someone from the east would flaunt their wealth and education. Not in Trump's case. It somehow makes him endearing. Blows my mind. If it had been written in a book in 2014 I would have thought it way too far-fetched. General Patton. One of the most historically successful US commanders, as well as one of the most loved generals of the war, defeats the most evil force to ever threaten the planet, then he dies due to a car accident immediately after. Spanish Admiral Blase de Lizo, 1689-1741. His career is just completely unbelievable. After losing one leg, one arm and one eye in several previous wars, and surviving all that related surgery without antibiotics, they were just not discovered yet. He managed to beat the second largest naval army in world history, and the biggest one created by a single nation, with an army composed by six ships, 1,780 regular soldiers, 500 militia, 600 American native bowmen, 150 men from the six ships crew, with that he battled, and won, 180 British ships, 30.000 British soldiers, the battle was so clearly on English favour that his commandant ordered one of the ship to return to England proclaiming victory before the attack started, coins were forged with the surrendering of Blas the Lizo, although they had to be destroyed later, long story short, Blase sunk his own ships to block the entrance of English ships into the peninsula, forcing them to maneuver in narrow waters, then defended cleverly all the in-between forts for earning time. He used the time to dig one meta just beneath the walls of the last fortress. When Brissith attacked last fortress the ladders they had prepared for climbing it were one meta short, so they couldn't take the last garrison. After British suffering around 4,500 casualties, 6 sunken ships and 17 to 20 heavily damaged ships. With the arrival of heavy rains in the area, they withdraw from the attack and retreated. There is only one bigger naval army gathered in history and it is the Normandy Allied fleet during Second World War. The fact that the US was ready to convert to the metric system but due to the wording of the metric act, it wasn't a requirement and the US gave up on trying to convert. There was a whole metric board and everything but due to the wording of voluntary everyone gave up on it. That the assassin of Franz Ferdinand just happened to stop for lunch at a sandwich shop that the Archduke's motorcade just happened to drive past. They ran out of budget to do the end of World War 2. So the writers invented this ridiculous super weapon that ends the war with two swift strikes. Then, despite getting into a lot more wars after that, the super weapon is never used to win them. Double quote. So, as I was saying, this kid gets his dad's army of 32,000 and decides he's going to poke the emperor of the largest empire in the world with it. Yada yada yada. Within three battles he's completely conquered the empire. Did you just yada yada the conquest of an entire empire? Comma so this other time the local general gets captured after shooting the horse out from under the enemy king and instead of getting his head cut gets made one of the commanders of the enemy army. Then he hears of this land far, far away that his king has never heard of so he asks if he can go see what's there. The king's like yeah, whatever, take a few guys and check it out, but don't cause too much trouble and be back before dinner time. And so Sabute took 20,000 riders over to Eastern Europe, decimated and subjugated Persia, Afghanistan. Georgia and a combined Rus and Cuman army for exercise, and then had lunch on top of their tied up and subsequently crushed to death foes, and is back in Karakoram before his 3 year time spin is up, yeah, okay, like anyone's going to buy this clearly Gary Stu character. Mark Orals, the nice old guy from Gladiator, later years, dude who has never been out of Rome becomes emperor. Instead of having his military proficient adoptive brother Lucius Verus killed, he makes him co-emperor and puts him in charge of campaigns. Mark Oral meanwhile stays in Rome, pushes social reforms and thinks about philosophy real hard. At some point the Germanic tribes get so rowdy, both emperors have to go north to deal with them. Only on the way there, Lucius Verus dies of a heart attack, 
so this guy with no military experience or connection to his soldiers spends the last 10 years of his life in a military camp in what's today's rainiest Germany, being a so-so leader and inventing a whole new level of stoicism. In a show, I'd assume the actor of Lucius Verus got fired and they had to write him out real quick. Yeah. I'm sure that some random Russian sorcerer was just naturally immune to poison. Bullets, knives, and fists for no reason. I get that every story needs a great villain, and Rasputin was pretty good there for a while, until the writers just completely ruined it by writing the most over the top death scene ever and never even bothering to explain it. The Six Day War. Israel had less land, was severely outnumbered and had less technology, like planes and tanks. So many countries were ganged up on such a small country along the Mediterranean. The deck was so stacked against Israel it was insane. But not only did they cut even, they flat out overwhelmed and curb stomped the enemy forces and essentially doubled their controlled terrain, ending the war in a mere 6 days. Not a plot hole, but bad writing. That we sent people to the North Pole and other really cold places just to have them die and then kept sending people until they didn't die. The English Navy discovered that lemon juice kept scurvy off, used that fact to help establish sea dominance, and then forgot the fact and let scurvy appear again in their ships. You see that in a film and you roll your eyes. The brave military genius Mark Antony just suddenly flees the Battle of Actium so that Augustus Agrippa can win, and they never really addressed why. Was he following Cleopatra? Was there some kind of miscommunication? We'll never know as the writers don't seem to want to clarify. If movies showed Roman and Greek statues painted and not white marble like they were iral, it would look so fake. We have become so used to our idea of the past that we can no longer imagine reality. D-Day. A few days of perfect weather before one of the worst sea storms of the year saved the landings. The German panzer divisions aren't deployed in time because they didn't want to wake Hitler up. The local general, Erwin Rommel, was at home away from the front to celebrate his wife's birthday. That's on top of the Germans eating up the Allied deception hook, line and sinker. Tommy Wiseau. Just him in general. Dude supposedly has no backstory and we had no idea how he got the money to fund the room. He's a living, breathing plot hole. Oh it just so happened that the British didn't receive letter than the war should have ended. So they had to make the Battle of New Orleans happen. Ernest Shackleton and saving the crew of the Endurance. Pretty much the whole story seems like it must be made up.